No, I can't see the entire title myself. Of extreme events on a global scale. Um, I'm obviously only going to cover a very small part of the extreme events. And, um, I have to admit, I'm probably more nervous than normally because I know that, that Ferrick puts everything up on YouTube afterwards. Um, but given that we had already other speakers being put there, I, I don't think I can check them out. Um, see the forecasting of extreme events. Um, I think where I want to start is, is just what do I mean by extreme? I think very often we talk about forecasting of extreme events, um, and probably most of the time we've got some certain um, application or a certain um, phenomena in mind. But um, realistically, I think we need to we need to first think what our, I need to first define what I mean. Um, particularly because extreme for one may be quite normal for others. Um, and I've put here two pictures. I I don't think that the the people on this caravan will be too much bothered about the temperature. But if I would have that temperature now in Reading, um, it would be fairly unusual for me. And I, I can tell you I wouldn't be dressed for that one. Um, exactly the same, of course, for um, rain. Um, for some people, having a rainy day and getting cycling home in the rain may be completely normal, whereas for others, it's probably an extreme. Um, and of course, you can spin this further and further. Um, Therefore, I do, I do think that in order to estimate extremes, you actually need to, you need to set this in context. You need to set this in context um, to an underlying climatology, um, to something you probably think would be more normal. And here I've taken an example, um, which we use at ECMWF, which is called the Extreme Forecast Index. The Extreme Forecast Index is, to, is, to, is designed to give you an indication on how extreme that weather is in in um, relationship to a climate. So what you see on this plot is a CDF. The black line is the climate distribution. Um, by the way, this is actually a, um, a presentation forecast for the, for the Philippines just before the, um, before the disaster. And what you see here in red lines, or in, in purple and blue lines, is different lead time forecasts. It's the distribution of the ensemble. Um, and what we have here on the top plot is 24-hour precipitation accumulated. At the bottom, we've got 24-hour maximum wind gust. Um, and of course, the more on the right-hand side the ensembles are, so the more away they are from the climate, the more extreme is it. Um, the same for the wind gust. Um, and you can see that for this particular example, um, in the beginning, maybe the lead time of, of, of four or five days, um, there was an extreme indicator for precipitation. And then it got more and more extremes the closer it gets to the event. And at the red line, um, it's really completely different to what we would expect as a climate. Um, this would be one way of defining it. Um, the other way where we probably often more think about is um, in terms of return periods. Um, return periods are also related to an underlying climate. And here's a plot from the extreme runoff index from um, Lorenzo Alfieri um, for the recent European flooding. Um, surface runoff at the station limbs, and you've got nicely here in the y axis a return period starting at one year going up to 500. Um, you've got a forecast of ensembles, um, and you've got three different warning levels in the upstream area. Um, and that would also be a way to trying to um, give you a feeling of how extreme that discharge is. Um, if you look at that particular discharge, you can see that actually in comparison to this return period or this climatology, there has been quite an extreme predictability or there has been a large number of ensemble members um, indicating a return period of more than 20 years. Having said that, um, climatology always sounds like a very nice concept. Um, people say, are oh, we compared to climatology or the underlying climatology? Um, however, um, there's many pragmatic solutions um, or there's many solutions for climatology. And I'm deliberately not showing you any station data or, or direct measurements, because I'm trying to talk about a global, more large-scale um, type of approach. And pragmatic solutions, um, here I've listed three. It could be the reanalysis, so the reanalysis, which gives an indication how the climate is, era interim, um, era 40, or the new one, which is called era 20C. It could be hindcast systems, which is the current forecasting systems that have been run for a certain number of years for past events. We have that for the seasonal forecast and the medium range forecast. Or um, it could be also the current operational forecast. Um, where's the kind of forecast, different ensemble members? Here's the observation. 
here's the model climate. They only forecast that some lead time drifts back to the model climate. Um, and you can see here this quite nicely. And of course, you can use this effect in order to build up um, your climatology. Um, this is a distinct advantage over the two previous approaches. Um, the hindcast systems are very often um, smaller. They're very often um, restricted through how much somebody can run on their big computers. The reanalysis are very often very um, set, set, set. Um, Air interim goes from 1979 to today. Um, Era 40 goes until 2001, and Era 20C starts at 1900 and goes until today. Um, but they all have a very limited set of, of, of samples, and very often they're based on an older model, an older model climate, an older science, um, because they're so expensive to do. The operational forecast has the advantage it's produced every single day. Um, so usually you tend to have a larger sample, um, although you don't have a larger sample in time. Um, I'm not just talking here um, theoretically. I'm just listing here a few examples where these climatologies have been used at ESMWF. Um, we've used um, or we build up climatologies for flooding, wildfire, health indices using air interim. And you've got a nice plot here of, for example, flood inundation map based on corrected air interim. Um, similar here is a health index. So up, up here in the flooding, you see flood and extent. In the health index, you see severity of flooding. Um, but it's based on error interim. Um, you could use the seasonal hindcast system. We've done this with malaria and droughts. Um, the monthly hindcast system, precipitation temperature, and you've already seen an example of that because the extreme forecast index is based on that. Um, and then last but not least, we have this concept of using operational ensembles. And we've done this in significant wave heights. And what you see here, for example, is the 100 year return period of a significant wave height across the oceans. Um, using that concept. Um, having talked a lot now about um, how to build up what an extreme is and understand an extreme is, um, I want to get to um, what types of extremes do I want to talk about today. Um, we have done quite extensive tests here and, and tried to figure out where is our forecast valid and useful um, in terms of forecasting. And I've, I've mentioned you know only six different areas now. Um, floods, wildfire, droughts, malaria, wind, and cyclones. Um, and we use different types of product depending on the type of phenomena. Um, for the more short term, we use the high resolution ensembles forecast that normally goes up to 10 days. Um, for the more longer term, we use the monthly and seasonal, so between 30 days and 70 years, uh, seven, uh, seven months forecasts. Um, and then very often we also use reanalysis to create additional conditions. Um, I was a bit too ambitious when I I was a bit too ambitious um, when I wanted to when I wanted to do this talk together, and as I put it together, I realized I've got a bit too many slides. Um, not not that unusual for me, um, but therefore I'm only going to show you some examples now of floods and droughts today. Um, if you want to have the rest, um, either get out your mobile phone now. At the bottom, you see this QR code. You can scan it in. It will be on a few slides from now on coming, so you have enough time to do it. Um, or you just search for this paper, uh, which is listed here. Um, wind and cyclones, I'm, I'm not having a dedicated publication. It's part of the ESMWF um, normal product, and I, I, I think I can, I'd be able to point you to the right um, publication. Just drop me an email. Um, the question is always why we're doing this. Ethan WF is a medium range weather forecasting service and not a not an extreme um, warning or not a not a warning agency. Um, however, our remit is including early warnings of severe weather in support of the National Weather Meteorological Services. Um, so what I want to do, I want to demonstrate the value we have um, using Ethan WF forecasts for these type of severe weathers. Um, and then it's up to the National Medical Services, the National Civil Protection Agencies, and public um, to go from there. Um, I think in order to, to give this some setting, um, I, I decided to start and just, just talk a bit about the Red Flats in Central Europe in 2013. Um, some of you may remember there were fairly recent. Um, all my examples are based on the European Flood Awareness System. Um, this is a system which produces medium range flood forecasts across the European continent. It's early information for transnational rivers. It's operated under Copernicus or GMES. 
um, and in support of civil protection national authorities. And why do I talk about this? Um, simply because ETHMWF is the operational center of it, uh, or the computational center of it. Um, we, are, we are running the EFA system here on a daily basis on behalf of the European Commission. Um, there's all the other partners involved, for example, SMHI, Slovakia, and the Netherlands are the dissemination center. They do all the communication to the end users. And then we've got a Spanish consortium which does um, hydrological data collection. And the JSC, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, still does the metallurgical data collection. Oops, too many logos. Um, so just to go back and, and, and trying to remember, I know it's June 13th, it's actually not that far far away, or some, some of you may have forgotten. Um, there was some persistent rain across Europe. It caused major floodings in Central Europe. Um, in Germany, around 10,000 people were forced to leave their homes, particularly in Saxony, Bavaria. Bavaria is in the southern part of Germany, um, bordering to Austria, um, and Saxony is in the eastern part of Germany, bordering to the Czech Republic and Poland. Um, in particular, the Bavarian town of Passau was hit very heavily, and it saw the highest levels of flooding in more than five centuries, so we didn't have any of that earlier. Um, and at that particular stage, Hungary um, had declared, declared a state of emergency. Um, I'm going to show you a small subset. The full story is actually appeared in an Eden WF newsletter, um, which you can look up. And there's also a, also a paper in HES, an analytical um, journal, by Günther Blöschel on that. Um, what type of flood warnings were issued or were in place in this particular case? Um, you can see here quite nicely all the triangles show you there was a flood warning. Um, the Orange triangles are alerts, the other one are warnings, don't worry too much about the difference. Um, and as you can see, it did hit more or less Central Europe, um, large parts of Germany, parts of Poland, parts of Austria, parts of Hungary. Was it really that extreme? Well, if you just have a quick look at precipitation, um, and what we have here is the, is the precipitation um, on, the, on the left hand side, we've got a precipitation. Um, just before the event, so um, end of May, beginning of June, it goes from 0 to 0 06 to 0 06. Um, on the right hand side, you've got the average um, of this precipitation. The color scale is exactly the same. And in this particular event, in just three days, a very large area um, was hit with 100 millimeters of rain. And it's somewhere in the Alps, it even peaked at 200 millimeters. Um, and this wasn't the only problem. The problem was also that, um, particularly the month before, was extremely wet. So the soils were wet, um, and the river levels were actually higher. If you look at the realistic forecast, something I don't do very often, because I think ensemble forecasts do tend to have a better um, skill base. Um, on the right bottom hand side, you see the observations again. Just use it as a sort of indication here. Um, where, you, where you expect the event. Here you see different forecasts. You see forecasts coming out from 10 and a half days to three days. Half days because e w issues two forecasts, one at 00 and um, one at 12 UT set. Um, you can see in the beginning there was some sort of signal. Um, in a way, it's 70 hours accumulated, it's, 70, it, it, it's accumulated precipitation, what you see here. Um, at the short range, you can see that. Um, the presentation becomes actually spot on. Um, what you can't see that clearly is that the presentation was severely underestimated, so although we had the location extremely well predicted, we didn't have the magnitude very well predicted. Um, in the longer range, you can see that presentation always hit the right areas. So this one, for example, is too far east, uh, too far west. Um, here you seem to have a pattern which is much larger, and at day nine, it seems to be roughly correct. Um, so we did have some signal that there may be something coming in the area, but um, the location wasn't that well predicted. Um, I already talked about the extreme forecast index. The extreme forecast index gives an indication how extreme the event is in comparison to climate. Um, here you've got an extreme forecast index starting at day nine, going down to day one. Um, and the color scale is fairly simple. The more red, the more severe it is. Um, and you see a very, it's based on your ensemble forecast, and you can see a very similar signal that the day seven to nine, the signal wasn't very strong, the location was there. Day five and seven, the, the, the signal became a bit stronger, but the location was probably a too, bit too far west. And day three and five and one and three um, is very clearly to be seen that there seems to be some 
um, really extreme precipitation coming along. So the event got, or the, the forecast got, got gradually stronger the closer we got to the event. Um, so far, the previous plot was based on precipitation at a point. Um, it's of course clear that the thing we are really interested in is actually precipitation over a catchment. And for that, um, we have developed something called the Extreme Precipitation Index, which accumulates precipitation um, across a, a catchment that's hydrologically more meaningful. Um, and we particularly use this for more flash flood forecasting. Um, and what you see here is an example um, of extreme precipitation. The red triangles are possible flash flood mornings, and you can see them. Um, the forecast is from the 1st of June, so it's a very short-term forecast, but you can see quite clearly there was a clear indication that even on a catchment ag ag aggregated scale, um, an extreme event was coming. Here you see one of the plots which I showed earlier with the return periods here at the bottom. It's based on the Cosmolabs ensemble, um, and you can see a large number of ensembles actually predicted um, fairly high return periods. If you just look at the probabilities of the ensemble itself, um, so the ensemble forecasting, and here the probability of exceeding 100 millimeters, um, they're starting at day nine and going to day one again. Um, there's some weak signal of eight to nine days in advance. And I think one has to understand that um, 100 millimeters isn't happening very often. Um, so if you see that type of signal already eight to nine days in advance, it's, that's fairly interesting. Similar to the domestic forecast, um, the signal got stronger and stronger over the, over the days, particularly from day five to six onwards. Um, and then at day four to five, the area of the maximum precipitation um, was extremely high, and the probability of getting that extreme precipitation was extremely high. This is 100 millimeter. Don't forget, I actually said that in the Alps, um, so this area where we actually predict this extreme precipitation, um, there was peak peak accumulation time was actually 200 millimeters. Just to demonstrate you that actually the soil was very wet, and here we've got a picture of the Oymetsat um, H soft product. It's the roots on soil moisture space, and ASCAT is also produced here at ECWF. And what you can here see is the difference from 2013 to 2012 for that period, at percentage of saturation. Um, everything which is blue is extremely saturated, um, and you can see the soils were indeed extremely wet. So we could even observe from satellites it was wet soil. Um, so we saw it in the meteorological forecast, we saw it in precipitation forecast, we saw it in forecasts which were more tuned to hydrologists and catchment base, we saw it in our extreme forecast index. Um, so did we also see it in, in the stream flow? And here you've got an image for the city of Passa, and I've just told you that it actually did experience it did experience a flood level which wasn't observed for 500 years. Um, here you've got a typical EFAS forecast plot where you have this discharge on the x-axis, you've got a date on the y-axis, um, you've got the ensemble represented as, as box plots, um, the black line is the high resolution ESN WF forecast, and the red line um, is the, oh, sorry, black line is the forecast of the German weather service, the red line is the um, high resolution forecast, and you can see quite nicely that actually um, on the 29th, we can see there's a certain peak, a peak appearing in um, the purple area, which is the severe alert level. So we've got four different alert levels here was hit. And there's some probability of it actually getting up to um, five and a half to 6,000 cubic meters per second. Um, and as we said, that was completely under, underestimated. Um, discharges were far beyond eight, um, up to 10, even some people estimate. Um, so although we predicted the extreme event, we didn't predict the severity even close. Um, if you look at this in a more historic time series, so the plot before was a sorry, the plot before was a single forecast of a single day. If you now have here forecast of different days, so we've got forecast issued on the 29th of May, on the 13th of May, 31st of May, on the 1st of June, um, you have here the percentage of ensembles exceeding um, the high alert level. So on the 29th of May, there was the prediction that 8% of the ensemble members exceed the high alert level. Um, on the 29th of May, for the 12 o'clock forecast, it was 12%. On the 30th, it was 10% and 24%. Um, this plot illustrates quite nicely that actually it was a very persistent signal um, five days in advance in the 
European flooding. So there was a certain signal coming up. As I said, severity was underestimated, but it was very clear that we had a signal reoccurring um, that the forecast would be getting worse. Um, the issue with me showing these plots is always that um, I'm showing you single case studies. I'm showing you a single example. This is not very good enough for verification. Um, this is a number of, of verification, or very simplistic verification for the European Flood Awareness System over the last years. Um, we've got simply here listed the hits, false alarms, and the unknowns. Um, so how often are we right in terms of our forecasts? I only have it up to 2011 on this particular plot. Um, if you want to see the rest, we've got, we publish a monthly, a bi-monthly bulletin, which you can find on EFAS at EU, where we report our past performance um, constantly. Um, but what this plot quite nicely illustrates that actually, um, on average, we have been better in forecasting, so we have more hits um, than false alarms or unknowns. And we can also show this in other skills scores and, and more complicated settings. Um, but actually, this forecast system is skillful. It's not just that single case study um, which works. Um, this led us to the development of a global flood awareness system. So far, we've only covered the European continent, so that tiny part here of the world. Um, and we decided to go ahead and see whether we can do this also on a global scale. And here you see uh, the screenshot of the global flood alert, alert level system from the 27th of July. Um, you can see the type of forecast being produced, very similar to the ones before. We've got here the discharge. We have here the ensembles. Um, this time, they're more indicated as blue lines. Um, and we've got, as you can see here in the Ganges in Bangladesh, um, different alert levels. The triangles indicate regions um, where our system suggests that you have a look. Um, we have some sort of automatic way of trying to um, raise awareness because it's impossible for a forecaster on that scale to look at every single point. Um, and um, what you can see quite nicely, the triangles are quite good. Distributed, you can click on the individual triangles um, and get these get these discharge hydrographs. Um, overlaying, you've got the probability of precipitation. Um, so just you have an idea where the precipitation was predicted to. Um, the system is fairly simple. It couples couples the EZMWF flood surface model called H Tesla to the list flood running routing model um, from the JSC. It's a collaboration with the JSC. Um, I believe it's, it's probably the future. It's the first integration of, or the first full integration of a flood forecasting system into a numerical weather prediction model or into a land surface model. Um, as I said, we've done some more detailed skill analysis. Now, I'm only going to show this plot. Um, next year, Lorenzo Alfieri will get some webinar, and he will go far more in depth than that one. Um, and here I show the performance um, of ensemble forecasts using the CRPSS. Um, very simple. Um, everything which is wet has no skill. Everything which is blue has skill. Um, and here I've got a lead time of five days and the lead time of 15 days. And you can quite nicely see that um, there's more blue than red, which is encouraging. Um, we're not very good everywhere. There are certain regions, particular um, where we have snow melt issues, which are red. Um, so we're not doing that well. Um, but large part of the blow, blow, uh, blow, uh, I globe are blue. Um, and then if you go to 15 days, of course, the skill deteriorates. Um, we still have skillful forecast in large parts of the globe, but many parts of the globe also have no skill. And then, of course, it's quite interesting because it gives us the motivation trying to develop the system further and actually getting better. Um, so far, I've talked about medium range forecast. And I'm, I'm going to now quickly skip into seasonal forecasting and drought forecasting. Um, I think it's always interesting that we cover the medium range, but I think we shouldn't forget um, that many hydrological applications and many water resource applications are also um, fairly important on the seasonal scale or need the seasonal scale. Um, I'm not trying to replace any other systems. There's many other systems out there, and I've just got the two US here, one, the US Drought Monitor, US Seasonal Drought Outlook. Um, there's Greater Horn of Africa, consensus climate outputs, and so forth. Um, our interest here was really more, can we use EZMWF forecasts to doing this type of analysis and this type of forecasts? Um, one thing one has to recognize that probably observations um, in terms of drought forecasting are far more important um, than they are, than they are in, in um, maybe flood forecasting. And the reason is that usually one accumulates over larger times. Um, so I've, 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 
presentation anomaly or the standard presentation index, which is in fact a presentation anomaly, is always calculated over a certain accumulation time. So what we have here is a 12 month accumulation time. And if I want to do a forecast of six months, that means I need six months of observations and six months of forecast. Um, if I want to have a two month forecast, I need eight months of observations and two months of forecast. So you can see that actually fork observations start to play an absolute vital and important role. Um, of course, I also do spatial averaging over certain regions, um, and I need to merge monitoring and forecasting, as I just mentioned. It's up here, you've got an example of that. You've got a monitoring area, we have observed presentation, and then an ensemble seasonal forecast here, which is then the forecast. Oops. What I've shown you in the block before is a very deterministic view of the entire setting. I see the observations in a single block, and I'm happily prepared to do the ensembles or the uncertainty in the forecast. What we shouldn't forget is that very often, actually, we've got no real clue where the observations are. So even observations in large parts of the globe have a large uncertainty. So I think we should recognize this. And um, rather than just having a forecast ensemble, we should also have an observation ensemble. This would, could be seen as a double ensemble approach, but actually recognizes the uncertainty observations. We do this in hydrology otherwise quite often. We do uncertainty initial conditions for many flood forecasting models. We do uncertainties in parameters. We do uncertainties in driving data. Um, particularly in the area of, of, of giant forecasting, this becomes vital to recognize. Simple example here, I'm showing you the probabilistic um, precipitation over the Horn of Africa. This is taken from a paper by Manuel Dutra, which currently is to appear in the hydrological in HES very soon. You have here different um, products. You've got your ensemble system here in gray, the uncertain ensemble system. But what we basically do, we, we string together a, a large number of short-term forecasts to build up a month. You see the monthly means here. You see the GPCP, which is one of the type of um, global observation products. Um, unfortunately, not available in real time. So also they have a first guess product, which is FGE. And we see the climatology. And what you can see quite nicely is even if we take GPCP as truth, um, um, we actually need to recognize the uncertainty to have the truth within our bandwidth, within our uncertainty bounds. Here's precipitation. You can also compute an anomaly here, which is on the SPI, so the standard precipitation index, again for the whole of Africa. And you can see quite nicely that maybe using just the first guess is not sufficient to represent the initial state for the seasonal forecast. Well, you can even look in this even a bit further. If you look at loads of other types of precipitation products, and you have here also trim, um, already converted into SPIs and precipitation anomalies. And if you look at correlations, you can see sometimes the correlations are high, sometimes the correlations are not so high. Um, it's very clear that different types of products will have different types of information. Uh, we believe that the ensemble shows here that it's actually performing better than error in trim, in particular when it's, comp and it's comparable to trim, which is here used as a, as a ground truth, or as or the first guess, particularly in tropical regions. The ensemble has added value because it's probabilistic rather than just a deterministic um, presentation. So far, I've talked about monitoring. Similar to before, where I talked about climatology, I didn't talk about forecasting. Of course, I've showed you forecasts before, and this is just a quick sample. Um, more or less to round up the issue of forecasting of droughts. We're forecasting here again the SPI, so standard precipitation index, uh, precipitation anomaly. The lower the anomaly is, um, the higher is the, is the, is the drought, or the, the more severe is the drought. So if you're down here in the area of minus 1 to minus 2, or minus 0.8 to minus 2, we, we could see this as, as a sort of drought. And here you've got two different um, you've got a forecast which concentrates on the Limpopo in 1991, 1992, the accumulated presentation over 12 months, the use of seasonal forecast in blue, and also the climatology, what we would have observed. What you see quite nicely is two different types of observations, okay, which we nice here in, in monitoring, so the magenta is the era interim, the GPCP, the global presentation product is made. They quite nicely, we go through the months, so we start in October, August 91, October, December, February, April, June, so we get closer and closer to the event. Um, you can see quite nicely, actually, there was, in the observations, a, a drift into a drought situation here. So 
the red and magenta line are under 2, are under minus 1.8. And um, some of the forecasts, um, like for example, the October one, indicated a drought. In a way, it indicated that actually the forecast would indicate a drought in comparison to climatology. In other years, climatology um, was either comparable, like here in August, or in other months, either comparable, like in August, a very similar forecast, or maybe even a bit better than the, than the forecast. So, seasonal forecast, in particular for, for regions in Africa, cannot always use, um, or are not always the truth. There's always also climatology, and of course, there have problems and errors. Um, what we can say is that um, on our analysis, which we've done so far across the globe, that on average, with a seasonal forecast, um, you can be better in climatology, and you're never worse. Um, so you're better off in actually using climatology rather than not uh, using seasonal forecasts rather than not using it. Um, just a simple example here is the Horn of Africa, and this is taken from a paper from Emma, who's currently who was visiting ECWF is currently in ECWF again, and she's also published a paper on that in Hess on using ECWF products for a very practical application. So using these forecasts really for on the ground forecasting. And what you here see is the rock score. Every time you're above this black line, um, the rock score is skillful, so it's better than, than as it's called skillful. We only look at March, April, May. Um, of course, depending on the season, you may have different skills. We're predicting two different events here. We're predicting you're not dry and not wet. You can see at lead time one, we are clearly above. Lead time two, we are still clearly above. And lead time three and four, we actually don't have necessarily that much skill anymore. So the seasonal forecast for the whole of Africa for this particular season can be skillful up to lead time three. If you look at different seasons, as I mentioned before, this is not always necessarily the case. I already mentioned that Emma actually used these data um, and tried to demonstrate on a practical example. We've recently been involved in the Fora project, and in there we were also quite concerned that actually our forecasts are used. And here's an example um, which is on Africa trying to integrate ECMWF forecast data as well as GPCT and many others in a forecasting system. Um, I always quite like this slide because I find it quite ironic. It's done within the European Joint Observatory Framework from the Joint Research Center in our show Africa. Um, so it's quite nice. We have different test basins here that you see here, but you can actually go to this website and you can have a look and see how easy WF forecasts compare to maybe climatology, maybe GPCP, and how what we would predict in terms of doubt forecasts. So I encourage you to have a look at the website. It's also very well documented to have a look. I want to very quickly make a link in my last five minutes, three minutes, in my link to climate, um, in particular because Tesla Vizanias is going to give a webinar next week, or next next year about this, um, how to see the forecast and, and climate link. And I think we can make a link um, in the sense of that does seasonal forecast, is seasonal forecasting something which can, use, can be used in an adaptation strategy? Can we use it um, for something where maybe climate change may occur or, or, or may not occur. So the first question we have to ask is, does a certain critical weather condition occur more frequently in the future? Um, and can we forecast the number scale? And when we, predict, when we can answer both questions with yes, then we know that forecasting or seasonal forecasting in its current incarnation, with its current state of the art, may be a suitable um, strategy. And we've done this with two different critical weather conditions in Southern Africa for rainfall, agriculture, maize, and dairy farming. I'm only going to show one quick example here, which is the dairy farming example, in particular the temperature heat index. It basically indicates um, how stressed a cow or, or dairy animal is given a certain heat. Um, the higher the index, the less milk production can be observed. So um, there's a question that the farmer should build a a shed or something to shade the cow. On the top here, you see climate change scenarios. I'm not going to go too much into detail. As I said, Heather's going to talk about it. Um, you've got here a 20% and a 70 percentile. We're looking at a heat index above 78. This is the frequency here or the percentage here. And you can see that from the scenario from 1961 to 2000, to 2011 to 250, there seems to be an increasing signal. 
So um, there seems to be some indication that um, regional climate models may predict um, some increased frequency um, in this particular stress index. If you now go to, can we actually forecast this index? And here's different forecasts with different lead times, five days, five months, four months, three months, two months, and one month. Um, it shows correlation. The higher the correlation, um, in this particular interpretation, we are more skillful. And you can quite nicely see we are actually also skillful in doing this forecast. Um, so for this, excuse me, for this particular example, we can argue that um, yes, we see a climate change signal, and yes, um, we are having some skill with this particular skill method, 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 method um, to predict. Oops. What, what HEPEX has done in the last years, it will look into the future. It will also give you some more information about meetings we have in the future, and also invites contributions from you. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Cedric? Yes, thank you very much, Florian. Uh, I don't know what happened to the at the end here, because I lost you in my um, computer. Maybe it was just my problem. But can you just repeat? a little bit on the last slide and the, and the conclusions. And after that, I will um, uh, leave the word free to everybody who can who wants to have a question. So either yeah. you unmute yourself or you uh, give, send me a chat message. With last slide, you mean the HEPIC slide? Yes. OK. Quickly, HEPIC, Christmas, 19th of December, 1530. Drink some, drink some mulled wine, get your Christmas hat, and listen to what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to review the past of HEPEX, we're going to review the future of HEPEX, and we're going to invite you to suggest new things for HEPEX, and we're going to tell you what happens next year in terms of meetings. Frederick? OK, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Michael Butts here from, uh, on, on the chat. So I'll just read it up to you. There's two questions. Uh, it was stated that seasonal forecasting is at least as good as climatology. Uh, would you say this is true? And can you show a map where seasonal predictability is good? Sorry, I just think um, we looked in terms of for the African continent in terms of chart forecasting. I haven't got the map here now. Um, and in this particular example, we could show that um, seasonal forecast is always at least comparable to climatology. It doesn't always beat climatology. I, I'm sorry, I haven't got the map here, and we will need to send you the paper to show you that in more detail. OK, and do you have any more questions from anybody else in the audience? Hear me? John, can you repeat that? Yes, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, yes. OK, uh, I have a question about the seasonal, the monthly and seasonal predictions. I've looked at the um, monthly and seasonal predictions of precipitation and temperature that uh, for the uh, United States uh, NSEPS climate uh, forecast system, their CFS system, the original 
version of it, version one, and then there's a new version two out. And one thing that I found was that the correlation between the values that are predicted and observed depend almost completely on the event at when it occurs that you're trying to predict, not the lead time to that event. And there's a very strong seasonal variability in that correlation. So there are times of the year in different locations, and these vary different from place to place. Have you seen something like that happen with the ECMWF forecast? I think yes. I, I don't. I think seasonal forecasting or monthly forecasting is still a difficult area, and and skill varies wildly. And I think one has to be extremely careful because the skill which is, and I think Tony has done the right thing in, in looking at it, just looking at it yourself, because the skill which is very often represented um, in the standard skill analysis of those type. Um, does not necessarily always reflect your application or the, the, the way you're going to use it. Um, particular hydrology, which may accumulate over space and time quite a bit, depending on your catchment, there may be actually some skills sometimes available to you from the seasonal forecast, which is not necessarily um, as apparent if you look in a, in a grid box by grid box accumulation. Right. By the way, I also found that the seasonal three months, uh, predictions were a lot more skillful than the monthly. The monthly ones can be very noisy, but the seasonal, the three months, tends to definitely show a better, uh, better skill. I think our experience is a bit different. Our experience is that the prediction of the monthly forecast tends to outperform the seasonal forecast, and there are several reasons for that. Um, the, I think the most important one is that probably the monthly forecast gets updated twice a year in terms of um, model and uh, data simulation and so forth, whereas the seasonal forecast tends to be a more frozen system. So you've got certain incarnations, we call it one, two, three, and four, so we can't read a seasonal system four, similar to CFS system one and two. So if you're actually going the opposite way, we actually believe it would be beneficial in merging the monthly forecast with the seasonal forecast. And Francesca Di Giuseppe has, has recently um, published a paper where she shows how you could do that. And we believe that actually we get increased skill by using the monthly forecast as well as the seasonal forecast together. And of course, quite a difficult, quite a difficult task to merge the two because they all have different ensemble members which have to be joined up. They have to be somehow slightly different statistically. So it's actually not, not that simple, I think. But I, I do believe that the monthly forecast, at least the results I've seen so far, are of higher skill than the first month of the seasonal forecast. Seasonal forecast also at ECWF is um, at causal scale than the monthly forecast. So it also contributes. There's many other factors which contribute, um, which I probably don't all know myself to say. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. I think it'd be uh, nice to find out why this happens, why you're getting the results you did. And the, what I talked about, all the forecasts came out of a an ensemble prediction or just a, actually it was a single value prediction where we use several dates in the past, single values to create the ensemble. But the ensembles used were exactly the same for monthly and, and seasonal prediction. We didn't have a separate model. But uh, I also didn't try to use any empirical indices or anything else to improve this. So there's a lot of things to be looked at here. and. Uh, Trying to understand why you're getting the results you're getting would be interesting, I think, too. Fully agree. Nothing else. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Florian. Uh, we also another question. Another question from uh, Mike Butts here. Uh, going back again to the climatology. Uh, so, could you expand a bit more on where it could be modes where the, the seasonal forecast is worse than climatology? believe this could be the case, particularly when the seasonal forecast drifts and you don't correct for that one. Um, and maybe Michael's right or make a too sweeping statement, but I do think it belongs on the, it really depends on the variable as well as the region. 
it, I can just say that we saw it for our particular case in terms of drought application that um, this was not the case. But Mike is absolutely right that um, one needs to look and very often this is not necessarily the, the, the general case and it may well be sometimes different. Okay, do we have any more questions? You can, of course, always email Florian with the questions after the speech. And then this presentation will also be available on YouTube guys, as well, so you can recap on it. But uh, thank you very much, Florian, for an excellent presentation. And thank you all for listening. So I'll end this session now. Thank you. And see you in, again in Christmas time. Nice to stand back.